All right, so welcome to Eat, Move, Think, the show about optimal wellness brought to you by MyCan. Wow. Oh, I was practicing. <laughs> okay, ready? <clears throat> welcome, welcome, welcome to Eat, Move, Think, Think, the show about optimal, optimal, optimal wellness brought, brought to you, you by MyCan. Yeah, that, this is extremely good. Thank you. Hey, Chris, have you heard of the Hard 75? It's kind of a funny name. Yeah, it is. I, so it's one of those things that you encounter scrolling through social media, yeah. I think, right? Yeah. It's like a hashtag you see, maybe. So what is it? Well, it's this trend going around, and it has to do with 75 days straight of pretty intense exercise, as well as a bunch of other factors. Like, I think you have to take cold showers. And it's like a more intense boot camp? It's like an online boot camp that you post your progress in, and it's pretty intense, though, from what I hear. So is it a good thing? I'm definitely not the person who can answer that, but that's one of those things that a lot of people are talking about and that they can't necessarily get the right answers to, especially from people like you and I. And the world of fitness and working out is so full of that type of yeah. thing. Like, especially with social media these days. Yeah, there's these like things that people just take as a given that maybe aren't necessarily true or, or safe or don't withstand, you know, scientific evidence. No. <laughs> I'm Chris. I'm Jazz. We're the producers of Eat, Move, Think. So questions like that are what we're going to be covering today. There are a lot of questions like that out there. and We wanted to make sure we give you the right and scientifically proven answers. And who's providing these answers in this episode? So we've gathered the people who were leading the MedCan personal trainers here. So we have MedCan's fitness managers, Anna Tapali and Tyler Kerr, and they're leading a discussion featuring MedCan's fitness team leads, Errol Ivanov, Simon Lim, Hamza Khan, Sean Trotman, and Stephanie Zemis. These are some of the the most experienced fitness trainers out there. They hear questions like this over and over again every day. So we thought, what better than to break down these questions and give you the answers to all of them in one go. And without further ado, why don't we just get into this episode? Yeah, the whole episode is going to be led by Tyler Kerr and Anna Tapali. So let's bring them in right now. Here's MedCan fitness manager, Anna Tapali. Hello, Eat, Move, Think podcast. I'm Anna Tapali. And I'm Tyler Kerr. We're the MedCan Fitness Managers, and we're really excited to be here with five of our fitness team leads. Why don't we go around and introduce ourselves? Uh, hi, my name's Hamza Khan. Uh, my name's Simon Lum. My name is Sean Trotman. Hi, my name's Errol Ivanov. Hey guys, my name's Steph Zemis. Between the seven of us, there's some pretty popular topics that come up time and time again. Some good, some not so good. Um, but everyone's at a different level when it comes to their fitness attitude as well as knowledge towards exercise. But there are always those same concepts that we repeatedly get asked about. So let's get into those and give you the honest science-based answers. Anna, you've got a big one, or should I say bulky one, that I think we should start with. This one's probably one of my most popular questions that I get asked about. Female clients asking, will weight training make them bulky? Huge, huge pet peeve of mine when I get asked this, I'm not going to lie, um, to achieve the physique of a bodybuilder or Olympic weightlifter requires an incredible amount of commitment and years of regimented exercise and nutrition. You will not end up there with, you know, two to three, let's say, set, um, weight training sessions per week. It's just not possible. So if you're going to break the ratio of the strength training routines that you do per week to how many calories you're actually taking in per week, it's just it will never happen. Um, Hamzam, do you want to expand on this a little bit? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for women to understand when they weight train is that to uh, 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 your size and the amount of weight you gain is a, is a direct correlation of how many calories you consume on a given day. So uh, the best way to keep a leaner physique is to increase your volume and calorie restrict. And if you do those two things, um, you'll kind of get that toned look that I think most most people in our industry desire, um, with with the exception, I mean, you get the occasional person that does want to bulk up, quote unquote. Uh, but in, in most cases, it's, it's simply a matter of calories in and calories out. So as long as you're controlling that and being cognizant of that, you should be pretty good. That's exactly it. Like time spent in the kitchen versus time spent in the gym. Like it just doesn't correlate. And also just to add on, um, as a beginner, whether you're a man or a woman, actually, when you start training, you'll actually put on muscle and gain, and uh, sorry, put on muscle and lose fat at the same time, which is something intermediate or 
um, advanced lifters can't really get benefit from. So actually, you'll actually start to look smaller, but more lean, which is probably what people desire in general. That's exactly it. Simon, you look like you have an answer. I, I like to joke with my clients when they ask if, especially women, do they get bulky after lifting a couple of weights? I'll, I usually say to them, if you get bulky after lifting a couple of weights, Hamza is going to ask you, what steroids are you taking? <laughs> because it takes a lot of consistency to get the results. Okay, yeah. so there's not going to be any drastic changes within, the, within those first couple of weeks. Just focus on the routine, focus on getting to sleep, focus on your nutrition, and making sure you're not spiking your blood sugar levels too high and too low. Steph, I'd love your insight on this. Yeah, I was a power lifter in university, so that's kind of the epitome of lifting heavy. I was lifting two, 300 pounds off the ground, squatting, benching. These are all considered very male-centric exercises and lifting, and I was probably in the best shape that I had been in a long time since playing soccer. So it really isn't about how much weight you're lifting. It is, like Hamza said, um, you got to eat to grow. So if you're not eating, then you're not growing. Yeah, and if you eat too much, then you're growing too much. Even, right. Even so you put the, on the, the wrong weight. Yeah. Yeah. I so it is a balance. The uh, misconception of stronger gain in a correlation to size is that mm -hmm. you can get very strong and stay relatively the same size. Is when you start to introduce like a lot of hypertrophy training and reps and volumes. That's when you start to puff up. So in females, conjunction with yes, nutrition. Yeah. 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 For sure. Like females should never be concerned about getting too big or bulky. Like you have. 18, 19 year old boys that are primed hormonally to gain size mm -hmm. and they're still turning to steroids because they just can't put on size. Yeah. We don't right, have so. genetically the ability to put yeah. on that kind of mass with our hormone regulation. Yeah. yeah. Steph, I got to know some max numbers. <laughs> I had no idea that you were uh, a weightlifter back in uh, school. Yep. Come on. Linda. I think my max squat was 275. <laughs> yeah. I had a fever a day before the meet. So my deadlift was kind of not quite there but i think i was benching like 160 170 nice. so that was pretty good just a okay, powerhouse <laughs> oh i'm not even close to and numbers. i got drug tested so i think that makes it more legit and you were drug tested yeah wow. yeah oh, on my wow. first meet why because of your numbers or it's just a general and you passed i of course I passed <laughs> i missed getting my medal but i passed nice. I think they random tests, but uh, there were girls who were lifting way heavier than I were really? was, and they didn't get tested. So I think it's just random. But apparently that was like a big feat to get drug tested. Everyone was very excited for me. Wow. <laughs> I, no, actually, no. To, to be honest, I did have a client that did. Um, I remember years ago we had to we had to change the way she looked at food because she did put on size like quite a quite a bit because she was training five days a week. Mm. Uh, so her volume was quite high, and she was eating the same, and uh, she wasn't a surplus. So she wasn't a surplus. Yeah. Well, yeah. So she and did get that bulky look. She didn't like it, and then she she pulled me aside one day during our session. She said, "Hamza, like, I'm not going to continue if I keep getting big." So we had to really sort of uh, uh, go back to first principles of eating and upper protein, limited calories. Even with, like even with this dieting stuff, like you'll see people go on these fad diets of you can still gain a ton of weight on keto or Mediterranean or whatever it is because you're simply just increasing the proportion of macronutrient that you're trying to get a deficit from, but you're just, you're just eating more of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So like if you take the, um, the carbs out of a keto diet, but you're eating too much fat. Mm. Uh, and if you know sense. how many calories that's worth, you can still put on size. So having to, it's, it's extreme. I'd say it's more of an extreme case where you have to sit down with your client and go over their food, um, and really help them out. But there, there's times where you have to really be introspective and look at what you're eating on a daily. And then, and then that's kind of, that's where you start. If, if that is your concern of getting too quote unquote bulky. Well, it's almost easier to get bulky like that because if you think about it, a, a one gram of fat has way more calories than a gram of carbs. So yeah. if you're eating in a surplus of fat and you're in a keto diet, let's call it, you think that you're eating healthy, but you're really not. Like you have to be careful with what you're actually consuming. Yeah, totally. Like if you if you increase your fat content in a proportion that makes up the carbs you eliminated, you're not really in a deficit anymore. No. So losing the weight is it becomes extremely hard. Right. What's the saying? What me what's measured it gets managed. What's mm -hmm. measured gets managed. If you, yeah. me if you measure out, not like very strictly, but at least have a mindfulness of what you're eating, what you're consuming, yeah. you'll be able to manage it better. And I even I even tell clients not to not to buy the yearly subscription. Like better than any nutrition course I've ever taken is just it's just downloading an app and doing it for three months. Yeah, yeah. Like you learn so much about what a cup of rice is worth and yeah. what six ounces of chicken is worth, calorie wise um, and macronutrient wise. And that peanut butter is not a protein source. <laughs> <laughs>
What'd you have for breakfast? <laughs> uh, I had a lot of protein, uh, peanut butter and <laughs> some milk. So <laughs> it's not. Totally. Just the food education element of, of tracking is, is, I think, phenomenal, better than any book I've ever read. So, um, yeah, if you get a chance to, to do it that way, I think uh, at the end of the day, it's all about calories and calories out. Yeah. And then you work from there. Okay. I have, uh, I have another popular question I kind of hear in the gym and have been asked a lot myself, actually, is... Can you use exercise to spot target certain areas like your belly, your arms? You know, you get the, you know, the wavy arms, you know, the back bacon or the muffin tops or whatever name you have for that area. People are always asking, you know, can I use exercise to, to lose the fat there in that specific spot? I mean, if there was a miracle way, I think if any of us knew it, we'd be, we'd be some really rich individuals if we could uh, there is a way just the belly fat. There is a way. It's just Naturally. not for nutrition. It's only surgical, surgical procedures will, will solve for that. It's not nothing behavioral or, or diet-based. Yeah, work. I mean, at MedCan, we offer a cool sculpt, which is another uh, technology I think that's used to, yeah. to spot reduce. And then we also have MSculpt. Uh, not sure if we're carrying that yet, but anyways, there's another technology out there. But the idea behind this is, is it's like, it depends on your genetics at the end of the day, right? So the way I carry 14% body fat is different than the way, you know, Errol would carry 14% body fat. And I think that's the biggest misconception in terms of goals setting. Everybody wants to look, they'll see someone's picture on Instagram or fitness magazine and they'll want to look like that. Well, those are very special individuals with a good uh, genetic makeup for uh, aesthetic appeal. And understanding that and understanding that we're all different in our genetic variants, I'm not going to hold 14% body fat the same way as another individual can change your goals in terms of what you expect of yourself. And it should be very like, you know, realistic in terms of your expectations for yourself. Some people store more fat around the belly. That's just even at 10%, they still don't have their abs showing. Um, some people store more in their limbs. And so they have a better chance of looking, looking leaner and more presentable on stage, for example, or in a photo shoot or having that beach body that we all desire. So again, being very generous with yourself and the expectations you put on your mental health and yourself on a daily basis can really mo rectify your expectations of what you should look like and just understanding that. And, and, and that's the biggest obstacle I think to get through to people because people think they have to eat a certain, like you can eat a certain way and as strict as that other person, but you're not gonna look the same. And that's really hard to accept, right? Uh, it seems unfair almost, but that's the genetic diversity of the human species. And if we can't accept that, we're not gonna really be able to ever have peace i think with ourselves number one to jump on that it's like everyone holds their their weight or their body fat in different spots so you know depending some might be right around the stomach the arms the back and then kind of as you're losing body fat or as you're leaning out it doesn't just disappear from that area that it was first put on it kind of comes off the body as a whole so i think that's why everyone's got those those sticking points on certain areas they want to try and lose from that spot but that's just kind of unfortunately not not how it works Hormonally, um, that will determine as well where the weight goes. <clears throat> where you are in your life, if you're in a stressful point, you're going to have a lot more belly fat because cortisol is going to store the fat on top of your abdomen. Um, if you're low in testosterone, you're more likely to, uh, if you're a male, store your fat in your chest. And then also if you're struggling with digesting sugar, it can get dumped on your back. So. Where you are in your life as well will determine how you carry that 14% body fat if that's your target. If you're not doing the disciplinary work to first start with your food and your nutrition and look at your volume of training, um, you're really kind of skipping steps in a way. You should, you should really look at hormones as a last resort. Go to your doctor as a last resort. Try working with a trainer and, and having a program that you know properly um, gives you the amount of volume you need in a given week. And then also try to look at yourself and how you eat, measure your food, be honest with yourself. Are you actually uh, accounting for the sauces you put in your food or the extra calories you put in here and there? Measure it, do it for three months, see if you're getting any progress. Then sure, like, you know, I would even extend that to longer because uh, homeostasis is a real thing and it's 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 where your bodies naturally want to be for a while but if if you can give yourself even more time like half a year see if you be again be very patient with yourself see if you can achieve those goals and if you can't then sure go see the doctor see what what's going on with you hormonally hormonally but i would always say you know like just put in the effort first and then see if if there's other things going on right uh like first get the lowest hanging fruit in terms of what you can address and then and then go for the big picture if you need to just from experience with my own clients, sometimes, um, as we know, life gets busy and life gets in the way of 
scheduling. So sometimes they'll say, uh, you know, I, I want to get that second workout in, but the only way I can make it work is if they're back to back because we're already scheduled on a certain day. So my clients would often ask, you know, will I be too sore if I don't take a break in between? Like, is it okay to work out back to back? So the way we organize, and especially when working with a trainer, is we'll take that into account. So absolutely, yes, you can work out back to back. Um, you know, as a trainer, I would program in a way that we're not going to maximal failures and that kind of thing. So, and even so, let's say you are doing back to back, you'll do upper body one day, lower body one day, or we'll do, let's say, more mobility type postural exercises one day and then strength training the next. So it doesn't I mean, sure, you'll still be sore because you're still lifting weights, but it, if you're not going to absolute failure, there is no reason why you can't work out back-to-back -back days. Yeah. Errol, yeah. Based on your training history, the more trained you are, uh, you're more likely to be able to train two days in a row. But again, based on intensity, if you train hard one day, you probably want to scale back a little more the next day. Um, and also you can split up body parts, upper body one day, lower body. Um, can I do cardio and resistance training on the same day? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, all dependent on which what your main goals are. So if you're more aerobic-based uh, performance or foc focusing on aerobic-based performance, you want to do the cardiovascular component first as you're the freshest and have the most energy and then the resistance training component. And then vice versa, if you're more resistance trained, focus or muscle growth, you want to do that portion first and then the aerobic aspect after. I also want to circle back to that question about can I can only do two workouts a week. Think about that question, for, except, for example, if you only have time for two workouts a week, the gap between you not doing anything and just getting one workout in and getting two workouts in is so huge, right? Like you need to, you need to make it happen. In terms of your like you if you're only getting two workouts in a week that's so much better than getting just one even if it is just back-to-back -back days yes optimally would we like to see you rest 24 hours and have some muscle muscle recovery and not work the same body parts sure but if you're in the per if you're the person that can only afford to have make time for two workouts a week then let's just get those two workouts in <laughs> Right, and so oh, oh, and like in our industry, there's this huge emphasis on optimization, and that's fine. Uh, but the gap between just getting your workouts in and optimizing is so insignificant compared to not doing something. Like just make sure you do something. And so if that means you're going to do two back-to-back -back workouts, then that's it. I, I know. I would also question the person like, what do you what do you mean you can only get two workouts in? Like you can go for a walk, right? You can kind of you can walk to the grocery store. You can sort of, you know, you can you can use a standing desk. You can do some stretches between appointments and meetings. So I, I don't necessarily agree with that premise. I can only do two workouts a week. I, I really think that you have to sort of keep your body moving, even if it's very minor uh, in terms of intensity. But the but the goal is to keep moving, right? Like the goal is to keep active, and and that doesn't have to be intense, right? It doesn't have to be super high intensity in terms of like you don't have to kill yourself, but try to. You can incorporate more movement than just twice a week is my point. That's something you can do when you're educating your clients, like when you're first meeting and, you, and you're talking with them and you're understanding that, yes, they're a very busy person. Like they've got a lot going on in their life and you can explain to them. It's not workouts aren't just in the gym. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of other stuff you can do outside and that's a good kind of way you can educate them on kind of movement as well. That don't discount it. Like walking, don't, don't discount walking. Don't discount, you know, standing desk. Things. Don't, they, don't they, discount. They add up. Yeah. yeah. Say you're doing the same muscle groups each day. There is some uh, newer research on muscle soreness and how re-exposing your nervous system to the same movement patterns and loads can actually help reduce soreness. So if you're someone that doesn't like to typically be too sore after a workout, reintroducing a lighter load and the same positions can actually help you um, help your nerve. Because at the end of the day, all movement comes from your nervous system. And if you re-expose your nervous system to those positions and those loads, you can help with the healing process in, in a way in a way okay so we kind of ask why is the why is the body feeling tight and that comes from the nervous system at the end of the day so what are we doing to sort of combat that on a on a on an adapt you know adaptation point of view like what 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 uh what inputs are we driving to maybe help the body be less sore so there are some benefits i mean i guess that would be considered a little bit of like active, active recovery yeah, yeah totally in the old days yeah it would yeah. say active recovery the active totally. recovery or if you're trying to target like kind of how we talked about losing fat in a spot area you can if you want to build on let's say you come into the gym and you want to 
get stronger legs or get better shoulders or arms, you do have to hit it multiple times a week for it to actually change. You yeah. can't hit biceps once a week and expect your biceps to change. So in that respect, you could do a heavy bicep day and then a light bicep day. Yeah, totally. Example. And again, we're talking about someone, this is like not optimal, right? This is not right. someone is that making it work. This, he only has time or she only has time mm -hmm. for two back-to-back -back workouts. Just, so I think the most good. ideal way for like the average person coming in here is if they only have two workouts a week, split the body parts up, one upper day and then one lower or one front of the day. So like chest and thighs, front of the thighs and then back of the body, back and uh, back of legs. I think if for the average med canner coming in, that's probably the best approach to get the best bang for your buck. For sure. Think, that's yeah. a, like, that's the traditional split yeah. and that can work really well for sure. Yeah. But, um, but there are some benefits to working the same muscle group consecutively back to back days or it's not, it's not a total loss. Okay. I've got another question here. Uh, it was, uh, revolves around sleep. So now I've been asked this question before and I'm sure you guys have as well. Uh, if I work out at night, will my sleep quality suffer? Does it depend on what kind of workout I do? And yes, the answer is definitely with that question, what kind of workout I do. If you have something that is new to you or a new stimulus or an intense stimulus an hour before bed, you're going to be lying there staring at the ceiling for a long time. You just put a lot of stress on your body. Your, your central nervous system is firing like crazy. You, it's going to take a while to come down, recover, and get to sleep. However, if you did something more like a mobility workout or like a yoga or a stretching routine an hour before bed, that's not going to negatively impact your, your sleep. It might even be beneficial, putting you more in a relaxed state. Yeah, I would also ask the person, like, are you already struggling with sleep? Like, is this already something that's a hard thing for you to do, to sleep on time and get enough, like, you know, enough sleep a day? And if it is, then probably throwing in a HIIT workout before bed is not exactly going to help you fix that habit. So just realizing where you are, uh, and if you're someone like me that can go to sleep no matter, you know, uh, what you're going through, then probably you get away with it. You could probably work. And I've done that multiple times where I've worked out an hour before bed, gone to sleep, no problem. But my sleep's already under control. So I think it just depends on the person, if they're already struggling with sleep. And then, you know, then, then you can tell them whether or not it's, it's, you know, best practice for them to do it. Well, it also depends on the environment too. Like if you think about where you work out it's typically not in a dark room with you know loud music playing right inside your ears like when you're going to bed the whole point is to slowly start throughout the day limiting your exposure to blue light like calming your system down like stop being exposed to stimuli so then when you go and work out and then you try and go to bed well you just were exposed to bright lights, loud music, you were exerting yourself so your blood pressure is elevated, you're hot because you just worked out, like all of these things are not conducive to sleeping. Just from experience, I used to go boxing with my brother at 8.30 at night. We'd finish at 9.30 p.m. And then, yeah, I'd, be, I'd still be awake at about 2 in the morning. Why? Because I was just fighting a war zone like a couple of hours ago. <laughs> um, so you're just completely wired. And the same goes for soccer. Back in the UK, I used to play games at 7 p.m. Um, in Canada, they play games at 11 o'clock at night. You finish at midnight, yeah, you're not getting to sleep until like 3 in the morning because all you're thinking about is where's the ball. <laughs> I would recommend, even if you are, if you can only get a workout in at the last time of night before you go to sleep, try and book in some meditation. If you get that done, that will do a bit of damage control and get you asleep earlier. That's a good point. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. great advice. But if you had to prioritize getting a workout in or getting a good night's sleep, always go for sleep because yeah. you can get away with missing your workout, but you can't get away from four hours of sleep because that's going to jack up the rest of your workouts. Just, you're going to start craving junk food throughout the, the following day, and then you, you may fall off track. So always prioritize sleep, nutrition. So true, right? Because most people are thinking counter. It's That's counterintuitive. Yeah, they yeah, think I, I got to get, get it in. in. That's right? why the, the hard 75 or these gimmicks, it's like, oh, I got to work out every day regardless of how I feel. It's like, you kind of you're setting More yourself damage. up for a yeah. for a train wreck. Spiral yeah. From there, yeah. My buddy's like, I'm gonna train for a marathon. I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run every single day. I'm like, did you not read David Goggins' book? <laughs> He's like, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm like, did you read the whole thing? Because at the end, his body is like a wreck. Like you can't do that. Like you have to listen to your body, monitor it, see how it feels, change the modalities. You can't do the same thing over and over and over and expect it to adapt and get stronger. So my friend got injured. He didn't do the marathon. <laughs> 75 hard is a kind of fad workout program that's going around 
And the premise of it is that for 75 days, you have to do one resistance training workout and one cardio workout. One of them has to be outside, no alcohol, only clean food. It's There's like a whole bunch of rules. You have to take a cold shower every day. But if you look at someone who has done nothing, finds mm-hmm. this challenge online, within two weeks, they're either going to be injured, malnourished, or yeah. something is going to be wrong because yeah. you cannot go from one extreme to the other. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a really insane example but it's very popular now so so that's why i didn't know anything about it because i heard it's like 75 days of consecutive pretty intense activity and i'm like for the general population that looks at this fad and be like oh i want to try this it's like within three weeks you're going to be in trouble but it's also a negative light on what like actual healthy people do like Mm. that's not healthy by any means like people underestimate the amount and quality of sleep that actually matters they underestimate that nutrition doesn't need to be like a scientific experiment you just have to eat healthy balanced meals workouts don't need to be like killing yourself in the gym crossfit 75 hard like you just have to go in and try your best and make it effective rather than not so yes. it doesn't need to be this insane thing. Yeah, and it comes back to the lack of knowledge and experience, right? So if we can impart those on people uh, through our training, then that's that's us doing our job. But uh, it's hard because you're combating insta fitness, right? And so there's a lot of you know um, fads going around, and, and we're always battling that in our industry. So yeah, it just comes with education and, and teaching your client. I mean, they they come to us as a trusted source of knowledge. Um, to shy away from those other things they see they probably there's there's all there's too much information out there that people are getting it's an information overload and you know we come people come to us with all kinds of kind of interesting or wacky questions that they see online and it's our job to kind of steer them in the right direction um kind of like to simon's point uh just to touch back on the the sleep quality after a an intense workout before bed like you don't need to shy away from it but you need to have a good recovery protocol in place to help you wind down after it's not you know hit the bag hard for an hour and then go jump into bed and expect to fall asleep. Like you need to have your cool down thrown in there, whether it's meditation, stretching, yoga, or something after to help calm yourself down to get yourself to fall asleep a little bit quicker. Um, but yeah, it's just, we're the trusted source. So we're just doing our best to, to educate the clients. So next question we've all been asked is fasted cardio versus non-fasted cardio for fat loss. And also, is it dangerous to work out on an empty stomach if you are doing the fasted cardio? So basically research has shown that there is no difference in body fat loss between fasted and non-fasted cardio. Fasted cardio may burn more fat during the time of the actual workout, but less the rest of the day. Whereas non-fasted cardio may burn less fat during the workout, but more throughout the day. So in the end, the difference in fat burn in fat burned is actually quite insignificant. Sean, Mm. do you want to help answer this question? I think much like several of the answers we've given, it's like we always lead with, well, aside from the body fat spot reducing thing is it depends because it's very much case dependent on the individual. Me, myself, I can can go on a treadmill or I can go on a bike, empty stomach and just just go because I've got ample fat stores to pull from. (laughs) But uh, somebody else has leaner, they may get on there, feel lightheaded and faint within the next 10 minutes. Um, So in that case, it's very much case dependent. Whether you're talking about um, its effect on your overall body fat and loss, I think it's pretty evident that it's negligible. So whatever you prefer and whatever you can perform best at, that's that's my recommendation. That's what I tell my clients. I think one thing to also be mindful there is if you do, because you know, some some of my clients, for example, don't necessarily eat breakfast right away. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm a big breakfast person. It's like the first thing I do. But if you don't eat breakfast right away and you do choose to do the fasted cardio, be mindful of the intensity that you're bringing into that workout. I mean, Mm -hmm. fasted cardio, let's say you're just doing an uphill walk at a speed of like, I don't know, 3.5 to 4. You're kind of cruising. You can still carry on a conversation is one thing versus getting on that treadmill and doing like hit intervals for however long. Like, Mm -hmm you may injure yourself and it may become borderline dangerous if you're doing the the sprints without the proper nutrition behind it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And what Anna just said, if you are doing HIIT training on an empty stomach, if you haven't had like an ample amount of 
carbohydrates the day before or a few hours before you might find your performance drops off because once your heart rate is above about 75 percent of its max most of its energy that you're utilizing in the body is coming from carbohydrates so that's kind of off topic on the on the fat loss but if you are doing uh, aerobic exercise uh, on an empty stomach and you want it probably on a lower intensity as you're not going to get the best bang for your buck if you're going all out and you haven't had the proper nutrition. But if your goal is fat loss, then doing a lower intensity cardio is just going to be more effective anyway. Um, typically, fat loss is around 60 to 65% of your heart rate max. So if you're going above that, you're not even doing the cardio effectively for fat loss to begin with. So it's kind of a silly HIIT cardio has its own purpose of training our cardiovascular system, but if your goal is for fat loss, you're going to want to do a lower intensity anyway. So doing that in the morning might not be bad. Okay, Sean, I got a question for you. What's up? How do I know the difference between that good sore feeling and a sign that I've hurt myself? What I usually uh, refer to my clients would be um, anything greater than three or four days of muscle soreness to touch. Like if your muscles are sore to touch for three or four days or longer, um, we've probably went beyond your capacity and kind of our workout was counterproductive. We didn't move you closer to your goals um, in terms of building strength or hypertrophy. So we would probably dial back the um, the training volume or the loads. The buzzwords for like DOMS or delayed onset yeah. muscle soreness is kind of like achy, uncomfortable when you're going down the stairs or whatever for the legs, as opposed to if you're going down the stairs and it's shooting or sharp. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are two kind of words you don't want to hear because that usually means you've injured yourself. Um, but if you're achy, sore, kind of yeah. uncomfortable moving around, that's that's okay. And generally, if it's if it's unilateral, like if if my clients say all my quads hurt or my knee hurts. It's like, is it one side or both sides? If it's just one side, that's that's probably a red flag. If it's both sides, eh, it may be all right. Swelling, tender to touch, that might be a sign that you're potentially doing more than you can handle. Whereas if it's more around the muscular area and it's just general stiffness, kind of tender, that's probably more muscle soreness related. And a good uh, scale is the pain scale. So one to 10, 10 being chop off your leg, zero being nothing, anything greater than four, no gold zone. If the pain is five or above, we immediately stop or we revisit, refer you out to sports med. When you choose an active lifestyle, you're going to have kinks, you're going to have soreness, but without knowledge and a guided, uh, someone to guide you through that, you could be kind of apprehensive in terms of moving forward. So we, you know, we, I don't think personal training, I think personal training is a luxury. I said this last time, but if you're just starting out, it's a necessity. You need to have that guidance. And so like, it goes back to the last question where like people have questions about being sore and you know, am I well, injured or how hard. should I eat? Yeah, yeah, pushing too hard and let us help you. So there are so many misconceptions out there. Hopefully we've cleared up some of them for you and alleviated some concerns or confusion around working out or lifting weights, I, whether you're just getting started with fitness, whether you're intermediate or whether you're super advanced and are just tweaking at this point. So yeah, I mean, if you have more questions or you just want to know how you can be working more fitness into your schedule, hiring a trainer might be the next step for you. We'd just like to thank our, uh, our great team leads for taking the time to, uh, to answer some of the, the heavy hitting fitness questions that we get on the gym floor every day. We really appreciate your time, guys. Thanks, Hamza, Simon, Sean, Errol, and Steph. Thanks thank a lot, you. Everyone. Thank, thank you, Anna and Tyler. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, a lot of fun. That was a discussion led by MedCan fitness managers Anna Tapali and Tyler Kerr, featuring MedCan's fitness team leads Errol Ivanov, Simon Lim, Hamza Khan, Sean Trotman, and Stephanie Zenis. You can book a consultation or a personal training session by emailing fitness at medcan.com. Follow MedCan on Twitter and Instagram at MedCanLiveWell. MedCan also has a great YouTube feed where we post the full audio of the episodes. We'll post episode highlights and other links you can visit on our website, eatmovethinkpodcast.com. If you want to hear another answer to a popular fitness question you have, send it to us at info at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. EatMoveThink is produced by Ghost Bureau, and that includes Jasmine Ratch's managing producer. Social media and strategy support is from Chantal Gerton, Andrew Imax, and Emily Bozik, as well as Amanda Serafin. Tina James and Naman Duta. Executive producer is that guy over there, Christopher Shulgin. We will be back soon with another episode examining the latest in health and wellness. 
This podcast episode is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation for endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with any specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan.